So the Gravatians, so if we were sort of thinking of the savanna worlds where it's warm, you have particular types of architecture and culture, very little clothing is necessary, S obviously certain ritualistic practices connecting you to the sacred landscape. The Gravatians between 26,000 and 15,000 during the Great Ice Age, right, produce, right, a very, very different and distinct uh, culture. <coughs> And that culture basically began to spread because the animals were out there. And as the world warmed up a bit, and I'll talk about that, and the ice began to retreat, the animals moved into the fresh territory, right? And they expanded and they multiplied, <laughs> right? And right behind them were the humans, right? <clears throat> and so the humans followed them, followed them all the way down into the Americas <clears throat> around 13,000 BC. Right? So in that period, right, from uh, the end of the Gravatians, which is sort of like 15,000, by 13,000, they, they make it you know, into, the, into the Americas. Um, they become the ancestors of the Plains Indians, which lasted relatively, you could say, almost into the 19th century until they were finally, at the, as the United States expanded and had battles and wars and diseases, more or less uh, their culture uh, was exterminated. <coughs> so that's really a long time, if you think about it, right? The, the survival capacity, right, of this culture, right? So if you look at it from the North Pole, <coughs> we can sort of see that there was this uh, different but yet coherent cultural formation having to do with these big animals, right? And it went down, and as they, uh, humans came across the, into the Americas, they hunted the, the mammoth until the mammoth were all killed off. And then they looked around, and the next biggest thing were the bison. Right. So they began to hunt the bison. So you could sort of say that during the Ice Age, we see a splitting taking part between the savanna cultures and the Gravatian ice hunters. <coughs> the Gravatians eventually die out, or they move, and they become something else. I'll talk about that. But that they're the legacy of that tradition shifts into Siberia and down into the Americas and basically forms the Americas, the consciousness of the Americas, even in places where there's no more Ice Age hunting, right? So even down into the rainforest of Brazil, you still have shaman, you still have many of the attributes of these sort of hunting traditions, but now in the rainforest society where they're not hunting big animals anymore. So if we sort of start with the sort of the, this emergence, if you will, now I'm going to shift from just the Gravatians to, if you will, the second phase of the Gravatian world, where the Gravatians in Europe die out, and we have this sort of long sort of horizon, both in time and geography, from Finland all the way down into the Americas. And what I'm going to do is just pick out just two architectural forms. One is called the Lavu, and it's made by the Sami who live in Finland. And the other, way over here, thousands of miles away, is called the Tipi, made by the Plains Indians here in the United States. And I'm just going to, there are other architectural forms, I'm just going to pick these two uh, to talk about them. On the surface, they seem to be very similar. This is a Lavu with the family of the Sami standing in front of it. And it looks Conical, it's made out of poles, and there's an entrance, and here you see the Lavu with their wonderful decked out, all decked out in their wonderful clothing. When you look inside these spaces, <coughs> you'll see there's the poles, and the poles don't actually converge, they're left open to the sky, so the rain will come in and the snow will come in, well, you know, it's not so good, but anyway, you have the fire and the metal of it. <coughs> So at least it'll uh, protect you. And you see they have to hold it all together, what's going to keep all the sticks from just falling all apart, right, when the first uh, wind comes, are these compression rings. So you have these compression rings, you tie them up with twine, and you're good to go. All right. So these compression rings can be horizontal. They can be sort of bent poles that sort of are holding all the, the things together, and they allow this to actually be sort of open at the top, right, 
Um, so they give it sort of a horizontal breadth uh, to these uh, spaces. So here we see a, um, a modern day sort of lavu, um, and then surrounded by, in this case, sort of uh, uh, reindeer skin. And uh, the, 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 you know, they're not hunting the reindeer anymore, they're herding them. Um, so obviously, you know, they do hunt, the mixture of hunting and herding, uh, partial hunting for food and, 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 and meat and resources, but also they're preserving uh, their, their stock and not just sort of killing them off. So if we think of the Lavu over there with the Sami in the sort of the the far off into the western edge, if you will, of that great hunting tradition, right? And now we move over to the Plains Indian, right? The, we see the similar type of tradition. The name of the culture is called Clovis. These named after an archaeological site in Texas. And the Clovis were the hunters who came into the Americas following the first the mammoth and then the bison. The original area of the plains, what we would call the plains, so when you even go out to, every, you go out to, Den, you know, to uh, you know, <coughs> Arizona, anybody been out to the plains and see the plains? Oh, hopefully, yeah, good, okay, good. And more of you need to do that, you know. It truly is, you know, spectacular open landscape, right, with no trees um, except maybe well, along perhaps a river or so. Well, most of the Americas would have looked like that uh, when the Clovis first arrived. There were very few trees. Trees eventually sort of grew over in, in, in the eastern part, and the territory eventually sort of shrank a bit, and you have then the plains and the sort of dividing the two halves. <coughs> and in that world, there ruled the bison. The bison of the original hunters was larger than the bison of today. Today's bison are the smaller breed that sort of survived um, through the ages, <coughs> whereas the larger breed was died off. So the, Bison are very difficult animals to hunt. <coughs> they're very skittish, um, and they'll be nibbling, and you just sort of stand up, and they'll see you, and then they're all sort of <laughs> running away, right? I mean, try catching a bison, good luck, right? And these are, the original bison were even bigger than these, and these are pretty giant creatures, right? So it takes a lot of skill to hunt the bison. You can't just sort of go out there and, and yodel and have them sort of come to you. So one of the things we do is, um, produce, uh, uh, use, exploit the fact that the bison are sort of skittish and they like to run every time you sort of jump up and they'll go on a stampede and you force them over a cliff. So this is a place called Head Smashed In, fittingly enough, <laughs> in Canada. Um, and um, it's now a park and it's been preserved. And what you see, you see, it doesn't look like much of a cliff, but it is a cliff. But from here upward, is nine meters of bison bones covered up by earth now, right? Nine meters is, uh, well, I'm two meters, uh, three, four, six, that's, that's basically two stories high of bison bones for like a mile, right? So we don't know how many thousands, uh, thousands of animals, right, were slaughtered here. The bison go over the cliff and the uh, the, the, the Plains Indians would set up camp here on the, on the bottom and they would get to work. Everything would be used. The skin, the hides, the intestines, uh, the heart, the liver, the horn, whatever it is, right, would be used and processed. It would take weeks, if not months, to do all that, right? You just can't, you know, I mean, the bison, you got to chop it up and then you've got to dry it and then you have to skin it and then, you know, um, and then everybody's having a big feast because you have bison stew for lunch and bison stew for breakfast and everybody's very good. And then you take the fat and you dry it and then you mix it with things so that you can preserve it over the, over the winter. So here's the, um, the, the jump and the, the, the Plains Indians, they put these stones uh, there and the way they did that was the bison would be nibbling around and if somebody um, sort of screwed up and stood up too soon, the bison would be running away from you. So they let the bison sort of nibble, 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 and then the people would be hiding in the grass very low, along, they could find the stones, and then they would crawl from one stone to the other stone, and they would line up, and then when the bison were somehow ready, they would all jump up, and the bison would go, ah, you know, and off they would go, right, over the cliff. So it took a coordinated effort. It's not just three or four hunters could do this, right, but probably 
you know, uh, a, a thousand hunters, perhaps, you know, were involved in this, right? And they would probably go come together for this event the one time a year to basically have a celebration, have their ritual dances, get to the bison. So here we see the drying of uh, the bison meat on these sort of racks, Plains Indians. And here we see also uh, the bison meat being sort of uh, being prepared.